Welcome back. In this video, we're going to begin our first error, which is the extra Canaan. So let's clear the board. And we're going to be dealing with why Luke has added in an extra Canaan between Arthraxad and Sheila. Now, the reason why I say an extra Canaan is because we have a legitimate Canaan, which is found in the Old Testament between Enosh and Mahaliel right here. However, this one, as I said before, is not in our Old Testament text. So why has this been inserted? So let's begin. And let's begin by considering Luke's genealogy. So as you can see here, he goes Noah, Shem, Arthurashad, Canaan, Shelah, Eber. Now the difficulty comes when we compare this to Genesis 11, in which we read Arthurashad had Shelah. There is no intervening Canaan as there is in Luke. So why has Luke added in this extra Canaan? And let's quickly just consult Genesis 11 so you understand the error here. So when Arthurashad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. So as you can see, it goes directly from Arthurashad to Shelah. There is no Canaan in between. So that's the issue. Now there's three options before us as to why this extra Canaan appears. The first is that Luke is relying upon a Septuagint copy which has an extra Canaan. The second is that this is due to a scribal error, a very early scribal error. And the third option is that Luke has deliberately added in this extra Canaan. So let's begin with our first option, which is a Septuagint issue. Now, let's go to Luke's genealogy. And as you can see, we have an extra Canaan. Now, when you compare it to the Masoretic text, we see an error. Because in the Masoretic form of the text, there is no extra Canaan. It goes simply from Afarashad to Shelah. However, when you consider the Septuagint copies, some Septuagint copies actually have an extra Canaan. So the argument would simply be that Luke is not relying upon an early Masoretic form of the text, but rather Luke is re relying upon the Septuagint. And this is what many commentaries are going to say. For instance, Nolan in his commentary on Luke says the following, The presence of the name Canaan, not found in the Masoretic texts, suggests that the Septuagint text is here being followed. There is also general agreement with the Septuagint morphology throughout this section. Fitzmaier says something similar but is more specific. He notes, the name Canaan is found in the Septuagint of Genesis 11.12, 10-24, 1 Corinthians 1.18 of, of Manuscript A. In all these Old Testament passages, the Masoretic text lacks the name and makes Shelah directly the son of Arthurashad. So here is a very simple argument, supported by both Nolan and Fitzmaier and many other commentators, who simply say that the extra Canaan is simply due to the fact that Luke is relying upon the Septuagint, which would be a very simple solution to our problem. However, many people don't take this option and they go for option number two, which has to do with a scribal error. Now this issue is a bit more complicated than the first, so let's take things slowly and let me bring up the Greek text. So here's the Greek text and we have the following. So here we have, this, so this is Luke's uh, genealogy and it says the son of God, the son of Adam, the son of Seth, the son of Enosh, the son of Canaan, the son of Mahaliel. Now as I said before there is one legitimate Canaan in Luke's genealogy and this is it. This is a correct Canaan. This Canaan is found in the Old Testament. However as we keep reading through Luke we find that there's the son of Arphurashad, the son of Canaan, the son of Selah. This is our Canaan, the Canaan that should not exist, while well, the Canaan that is not found in the Masoretic form of the Old Testament. So people are going to argue the following, that Luke, in his original gospel, only put this Canaan. But then a very early copyist of Luke's gospel, seeing this Canaan, accidentally inserted it up here as well. So their eye simply slipped and they inserted this Canaan up here. And this is something that Safati argues in his article. He writes, But suppose an early copyist of Luke's Gospel was copying the first line, but his eye glanced at the end of the third line, at son of Canaan. Then he would have written it on the first line as well. So this argument is simply saying that Luke has not made this error. Rather, it is attributed to a very early scribe who made this error. However, Hopefully you see something immediately suspicious about this option. And it has to do with what I said before in option one, number one. In option number one, I told you that some copies of the Septuagint have this extra Canaan. 
which is interesting because the scribal error explains why the extra Canaan exists in Luke's copy, but why on earth would it then appear in the Septuagint copy? So this is the issue that this option faces. Why does the Septuagint also have an extra Canaan? And Safati realizes this issue. So let me just restate the issue once more so you have it clear in your head. They're going to argue that Luke originally did not put in this extra Canaan, but rather it is due to an early copyist error. Well, if this is true, why is it that some copies of our Septuagint also have this error? It shouldn't be there if it was an early copyist error of Luke. Safati writes the following. So if a copyist of Luke's gospel is responsible for the error, how come it is in the Septuagint as well? A clue to the solution is that the extra Canaan in Genesis 11 is found only in the manuscripts of the Septuagint that were written long after Luke's gospel. The oldest Septuagint manuscripts do not have this extra Canaan. Now this is where things get a little bit difficult, and I really need you to turn your brain on for this part because it's a little bit confusing. So here is what Safati is arguing. He's arguing that the early copies of the Septuagint do not have this extra cop- extra Canaan. Let me say that again. The early copies of the Septuagint do not have this extra Canaan. This extra Canaan is only found in our later manuscripts. So why does it appear in our older manuscripts? Why does this extra Canaan appear in our older manuscripts? Well, it's because Christian scribes of the Septuagint were wishing the Septuagint to cohere with Luke's genealogy. So because there was a scribal error of an extra Canaan in Luke, the Christian scribes inserted this extra Canaan into the Septuagint copy in order that Luke's genealogy would be the same as the Septuagint genealogy. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, in order for this contention to be true, Safati would have to provide us us evidence that the early copies of the Septuagint do not have this extra Canaan. Is there any evidence that the early copies of our Septuagint do not have this extra Canaan? And in fact, there is. The first person that we're going to be referring to is Philo. And the book that he wrote is called Biblical Antiquities, and it probably actually was not written by Philo at all, and it was written in the late first century. And in this document, we are told that Afarashad begat Selah. So as you can see, there's no intervening Canaan between these two names. So this is evidence that Pseudo Philo was relying upon an early Greek form of the text that did not have this extra Canaan. Now, let me just briefly say this. It's not particularly clear whether or not Biblical Antiquities was first written in Greek or Hebrew, or what the sources were, whether the source for Biblical Antiquities was Greek or Hebrew. Nevertheless, I'm still going to count this as evidence that a very early form of the text did not have this extra Canaan. I just needed to uh, say that. All right, the next person we're dealing with is Josephus. And Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews, tells us that Selah was the son of Afrashad. So here again, there's no intervening Canaan. So this is yet further proof that the extra Canaan did not exist in the early form of the Septuagint. And we're pretty confident that Josephus was using the Septuagint. Safati notes the following. If Josephus did not use the Septuagint, he must have used some document based on the Septuagint, for it repeats too many of those mistakes of the Septuagint to be a chance occurrence. It appears, at the time of Josephus, the extra generation of Canaan was not in the Septuagint text, or the document that Joseph used, Josephus used otherwise. Oh, sorry, let me say that again. Or the document that Josephus used, otherwise Josephus would have included it. To put it simply, it seems at the time of Josephus, so again, late first century, that the Septuagint copy did not have an extra Canaan. And the last person we're going to be referring to is Julius Africanus, and he notes in his book that after the flood, Shem begot Apharaxad, and Apharaxad begat Selah. So again, no intervening Canaan. So this is yet further proof again that an early Septuagint form of the text did not have Canaan. Safati notes the following. Julian Africanus, the first Christian historian known to have produced a universal chronology, in his chronology, written in 220 AD, he has also omitted the mysterious Canaan. The number of years in this chronology is identical to those of the Septuagint, which, this is me saying, is proof that Julius Africanus was using the Septuagint copy, not another form of the text. 
This shows that he must have used the Septuagint, but no Canaan even as late as 220 AD. So even as late as 220 AD, it appears that some copies of the Septuagint did not have this extra Canaan. Alright, so this seems to be pretty good evidence that the extra Canaan did not originally exist in the Septuagint. Safati notes the following. Oh, this is actually Pierce in another article. He writes, I think we have more than enough evidence that would stand up in any court of law to show that every single copy we have of the Septuagint text was corrupted sometime after AD 220. The copies of the Septuagint available to both Josephus and Africanus do not include this spurious generation. It is also not in either of the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Hebrew manuscripts. So now that we're asking the question, did this extra Canaan exist in Genesis 11, I think we can confidently say that it probably did not exist in the original Genesis 11 because our early copy of the Septuagint didn't have it, and also because the Samaritan Pentateuch didn't have it, and the Masoretic form of the text didn't have it. So this is all pretty good evidence that the extra Canaan is not original to Genesis 11. And now based on the fact that the extra Canaan was not original to Genesis 11, Safati is going to claim that this evidence shows conclusively that the extra Canaan is not part of God's original word, but is due to a later copyist error. Now this may on the face of it seem convincing, but I am convinced that Safati here has made a big logical error. And it's the following. It's not good enough for Safati to show us that the Genesis 11 originally did not have an extra Canaan, to prove that it's a later copious error. In order for him to prove that this is a later copious error, what he needs to do is show us that the earliest copies of Luke omit this Canaan. Otherwise, this evidence on its own doesn't necessarily necessitate that the extra Canaan was an early scribal error of Luke. And in the next video, we're going to be discussing the early copies of Luke and determining whether the extra Canaan is there or not. This has been a very difficult concept for you to get. It's very difficult for me to get. Hopefully you've understood it all and I'll see you in the next video.